Honey cat. You ready for church? No, this is breakfast. Well, actually, I don't have anything to wear except my fur. What? That welcomes us into your presence and reminds us that we are your children. Lord, we pray this day that as we sing of your great love, as we greet you, Lord, that the Spirit of God would be with us. Lord, we're thankful for your life. Lord, we are covered by your death. Receive our worship today. And loudly, God's people say, Amen. Amen. say that you are God that is to be found. Lord, there are people in this community this week, Lord, that are wrestling with their darkest valleys. We are thankful that you are God who is present in our suffering. Lord, and present in the sufferings of those that we love deeply. Thank you, sir. Well, good morning. It's great to be together this morning. 
Praise God. That God promises to be with us when we seek to find him. I'm so grateful to be part of a church that's seeking and following Jesus wherever he leads. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Philip. I have the honor of being the pastor here at First Baptist Church. And we're about one thing. We're going to follow Jesus where he leads. And that's it. Praise God. I don't care how you dress in a nice way. Don't care where you've come from. Right? Everyone, raise your hand if you're an imperfect person here. Raise your hand if you're not perfect. Oh. Look, yeah, I know some of you. You're definitely not, right? <laughs> Those who are listening, I'm like, oh, I think already. Good. Welcome to the club of imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. Amen. Forgiven, redeemed, and God making new. We're so honored that you're with us. Uh, and, and if you are new or if there's something you'd like to communicate with me, I just want to warn you. If you tell me something in passing on Sunday, the chances of me remembering it are whatever less than zero is. I wasn't that good at math. Uh, so if there's something you'd like to communicate to me during the week or a, a prayer request or if you're new, um, I'd love to be able to reach out. So these neon green cards in the seat pocket in front of you... Um, uh, our connection card, and we'd love to have you fill that out and put them in the giving boxes that are out in the lobby, narthex, foyer, whatever you want to call it, the area you walked in on if you came through the front door. Um, for those of you who call this place home, thank you for faithfully giving. But you might notice that we're not a church that passes plates, and you want to know why? No. Because it's super weird. Right? Raise your hand if that's your favorite part of worship, passing a plate. Okay, one of you. I'll give you a plate, and you can pass it back and forth to yourself. Anyway, so, but as a church, we do give faith. We have a bunch of ways to give. Like, this is a church that's exceedingly generous. I'm so thankful that people view their resources as, as something that God's going to use to transform our community. So I'm just thankful. There's tons of ways to give. If you can't figure it out, I got nothing for you. Uh, you can put it in the box on your way in or out today. So I have a few uh, pieces of housekeeping. Uh, I want to uh, apologize in advance. How many of you read the email I sent out today? Uh, well, not today, on like Tuesday, that was super wrong. Awesome, I made like three mistakes, I'll call it, call it like post-Easter delusion, uh, but I had like four mistakes in it. So there are updated with correct information newsletters for April, so if you wanna know what's happening here, you can either go on your app on your phone, download the Church Center app and see it there, or you can just grab it on your way out, it's on the table. Second, for those of you who have been reading Canoeing the Mountains, I'm curious, who's actually been reading that other than the elders and deacons who I made read it and tell them they don't have an option? So after church today, in that area, whatever that area is called, we're going to be meeting together and spending an hour praying, talking, sharing, and reflecting on the things that are taught in that book. Uh, if you'd like to come and be a fly on the wall, you're more than welcome to, but if you can't read, you can't talk. Uh, so... But, but come and listen. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Last but not least, um, out on the little table as you walk in is a Bible study. Uh, we're going to be going through the book of Ruth for however long until we finish, uh, probably a couple months. And we put together a Bible study for chapter one. Uh, and I want to put out a challenge right now. Um, we're going to be in chapter one for the rest of the month. It's going to take us a month to get through chapter one. Because there's lots to talk about when you're in Moab, uh, which I'm sure you're all really excited about. You woke up this morning like, I want to know everything there is to know about the Moabites. Right? That's your first off this morning. But there's a really well put together Bible study. And here's a challenge. Um, how many people sometimes have a difficult time being consistent and understanding scripture when you're reading on your own? Is it easier or harder on your own? Harder, harder right? It's way more difficult. That Bible study is not for you to do on your own. So here's what the challenge is before April ends. I would like, I'm gonna challenge each person to grab a copy. Um, I'll post them on the website, you'll be able to download it from there as well. I wanna invite you to do the Bible study with another person. Like whether it's a neighbor, whether you wanna sit down as a family and do it, whether you like, I don't know anyone to do it with, look at someone in this room and says, I wanna do the Bible study with you, right? And if it's over Zoom, if it's over the phone, I don't care. But over the course of this month, I want to challenge you to grab one. And I'm going to do it for each chapter of the book of Ruth. Each month, we're going to kind of work our way through a chapter. And then each month, we're going to have one for you. And I want to really challenge you. Uh, all the questions are there, the background context, like you'll learn about the Moabite gods and the time of the judges and all sorts of cool things. But I want to just encourage you. Everything you need to do the Bible study is on a piece of paper. You just go through, talk through the questions. 
wrestle with the scripture and pray together. So before the month ends, grab one. And kids, if you're a parent, you can like check up on your parents on this one. If you're under 18, raise your hand in the room. All right. Oh, good. Ruth, you're not. I mean, you're not. sorry. It's not true. It's good. Uh, you guys get to ask your parents how their Bible study went. And you guys get to be the ones holding them accountable. So feel free to ask them how fantastic the Bible study was and if they'd like to do it with you. Uh, instead of just by themselves. But I really want to challenge you. I think it's going to be a great opportunity for those of you who have never studied scripture with other people. It's an incredible experience, and God moves in a unique way. Grab one, the dead horse is officially beat, and we're jumping into room. Let's pray. We are so thankful that you are a God who is with us in the midst of our foolishness, In the midst of the times where we miss the mark, God, you are faithful to always keep it one more step back to you. Lord, we pray today for this time in the book of Ruth. Lord, we trust your word that says your scripture is, is active and it's alive and it speaks to us. So Lord, we pray in this time that all the other competing thoughts in our head for the foreseeable future for the next 30 or 40 minutes would just be set aside. And we would be able to be present with you and hear from you and be encouraged and challenged and blessed by you. Lord, may we not add or subtract a single thing from your word today. Speak to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone in person and online says... Amen. 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 All right, well, let's jump into it. So we're going to jump straight into the scripture this week. And if you came here thinking you wouldn't talk to anyone, like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to talk to people. So emotionally prepare yourself, introverts, who are afraid to talk to other people. This is not going to be your favorite Sunday. Um, so let's go and pull up the scripture. We're going to read this together. And I'm going to invite you, if you're up for it, I'll be reading out the ESV. There are Bibles underneath. Your seats, you probably want one. You either want one in your hand or yours on your phone. It will become imperative in about three and a half minutes uh, to have one. So there should be one in front of you where you can grab your phone. So let's jump in and start reading Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. Say Elimelech. Elimelech. There we go. And the name of his wife is Naomi. And the names of his two sons were, say, Malon, Malon. Malon. and Kilion. Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. Next verse. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These, two, these took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years. And both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her, husband, her two sons and her husband. That's it. All right, next slide. Go ahead and pop it up. So here's what I want you, you have a little work to do. So I want you to look at the people around you, say hello, introduce yourself if you don't know them. Um, and here's what I can do. I want, you need to, you have two minutes to do this. You need to pick a word or a short phrase. A phrase is not this long, like, I'll give you like three or four words max. To describe, to, 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 to describe verses one to three, and then four to five. Does that make sense? So you got your Bible in front of you? So who said no? Who was confused? Okay, so one to three. Find a word to describe it. Four and five, find a word to describe it. Then we're going to come back and share them. On your marks, get set, awkwardly look at the person next to you. <gasps> Go. <laughs> All right. Did anyone else learn that when they were a little kid? I sang the song. I'm pretending like I'm not singing the song in my head when I say that. All right. We're going to just jump for it. Okay. Verse one to three. What was the word or phrase that you came up with? Yell it out. Sadness. Sa sadness. All right. One to three. What, what other words? Well, I have no idea. Background. Background. All right, what else? Bittersweet. Bittersweet. Famine. Famine. What other words? Famine. Future. No. Did you say future? Did someone say something over here? Sorry, I should have waited. All right, what other words? Come on. That was more than, there were a whole lot of you talking. Despair. Anything else? 
Bad luck. <laughs> Bad luck. <laughs> like what? as if there is luck. Death. There's no luck. <laughs> did someone say terror? Terrible. Terrible. There you go. All right. What did you say? Bad choice. Relocation. Yeah. All right. What else? What other words? Huey family. Humor me. <laughs> Refugees. What other words? Come on, give me a couple more. What? I can't, I don't know. Left alone? Uncertainty. Uncertainty. Give me one more. They didn't trust God. Didn't trust God. All right. All right, get back in your groups if you didn't, did everyone have a chance to do four and five as well and pick a word? Yeah. You did? All right, go. Let's hear four and five. What, what, what's your word for four and five? Go. Death. 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 Mm -hmm. What'd you say? Devastated. Marriage. What other? Despair. Widowed. Despair. Loss of a child. Loss of a child. Changed. Changed. Hopelessness. Hopelessness. Fear. Sorrow. Sorrow. Fear. Loneliness. Loneliness. Depressing. It's really intense. It's good. I hope you weren't planning on being encouraged this morning. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Jesus is with us even when it's hard. All right. All right, the start of this book is utterly and completely scandalous. For the people who first hear it, heard it, they would hear these first words and be completely and utterly scandalized by what he did. So we're going to jump into this. We're going to tear apart the scripture. We're going to feast on it. I'm going to give you way more historical background than you'd ever care to know. Uh, so we'll retain like 20% of it and have a great time today. So let's go ahead. Can you bring the verse 1 back up for me, Anna, please? All right. Let's do this. So it starts out, in the days when the judges ruled. And for those first hearers who heard this, when they heard that word, they had a very distinct thought. So that was somewhere between 1,200 and like 1,000 years before Jesus came. That was the time of the judges. It was a time after the Israelites had come out of slavery in Egypt through the wandering in the wilderness to the promised land. And that space between Joshua's death and David or and Saul's rise as, as king is the time of the judges. And I'm just going to let you know, the time of the judges might be one of the worst parts of Israel's history in the Old Testament. It was an incredibly dark time. One commentator wrote this, The book of Judges teems with violent invasions, apostate religion, unchecked lawlessness, and tribal war. It was a time of fear instability and people wandering from God. Judges chapter 21 describes it as like, like this. Hear this. In those days, meaning in the time of the judges, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eye. Just think about that for a minute. Like how many people here have had children? Right? What would happen if you allowed that to happen in your house? It's terror, right? Like... Same with adults, right? So this was a time in Israel's history where people decided what they did based on what their desires were. Does that sound familiar at all? No. Anyone ever lived in a time and a moment in human history where people thought just because they feel like it's true, it is true? Anyone ever thought that? Maybe you live in a world that's marginally similar to that? It says, my truth is my truth, my good is good, right? Right, the judges, in a lot of ways, in, in terms of worldview and paradigm, was very similar to the times that we find ourselves in there. It was an uncertain time. Israel was constantly invaded, and they like embraced the gods that lived around them. And, and if you didn't know, the Canaanite gods in that time were particularly vile. We'll get to that a little bit later, but their worship practices were disgusting and evil. Their, their worship revolved around perverting nature to its most intense extreme, right? So there's some odd rules in the Old Testament, like you can't cook a, a baby goat in its mother's milk, right? To us, that just feels like a really random thing that God threw in the book, right? But in that time and in that place that they lived in, worship was the most depraved, antithetical thing to nature that you could do helped you connect with God. Right? And what's more evil than killing an animal in its own mother's milk? Right? This was the space and the time that this story takes place. It was a dark 
and tumultuous and heartbreaking moment. And in the midst of this time when the judges ruled, what happened? There was a famine in the land. So Elimelech and his family are living in the Bethlehem. And all of a sudden, tragedy struck. Uh, back in the day, they didn't water crops like you and I did. What did they have to wait for? Rain. Rains. And what happened if it didn't rain? Drought. And he didn't eat. And where did people go to get food if there was no food? Okay. Nowhere. They starved to death. Right? And the ancient world was brutal. And the ancient world was ruthless. And there was no safety net for the people in Israel other than the offerings that came to the temple that were distributed for the people to receive food. But for the original hearers, you hear famine and a little light goes on in their head, right? And this is why it's so important when we're reading Old Testament to understand its context. The, the three major patriarchs in, in, in the Old Testament are Abraham, Isaac, and who? Jacob, all three of them as significant parts of their journey as they stepped into the next thing that God had for them. It was precipitated often by famine. It indicated the reality in this moment where they had to walk with God in a way that required huge amounts of faith. That they had to trust God that God would provide even when things seemed incredibly difficult. All right, we finish up verse 1. And the man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So Bethlehem means, do you want to know what Bethlehem means? I didn't know before. Dang. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Bethlehem means house of bread. Right? So you're entering into a story, and the author tells us that in the house of bread, what was there? There's no food. But where was their food? <coughs> where, where was their Moab. food? In Moab. So when you think Moab, what do you think of? You know, have a strong emotional response to Moab. Okay, how many people have a strong emotional response to ISIS? Anyone have a strong emo negative emotional response to ISIS? Okay, Moab to Israel is what ISIS is to us. Not a, not a group of people that were more adversarial or evil for Israel, right? It wasn't just like, oh, these are the people near us they don't really like you very much. These are people who, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, threatened to attack them. It was a depraved, broken... Uh, earlier in Judges in chapter 3, we learned that, that the king of Moab was attack and overtook large portions of Israel during the time just before. This wasn't just like a random place that he went to. It'd be like you saying, oh, there's not a lot of food in Manistee. Where should I pick up and go? Right? Syria. It's like it's that kind of breathtaking. And the people who heard this would be scandalized that of all places Elimelech would go, he'd go to the place and the country that exists to live in opposition to Israel. Moab is a mountainous region, right east of the Dead Sea. It's this giant fertile plateau about 25 miles wide. And I think it's really fascinating. So uh, Moab was outside of the promised land that God had led them into. So in the midst of difficulty, Elimelech decides to take his family from the promised land, the place where God promises to dwell, and goes back to the wilderness. God just brought them out of exile and out of 40 years of the wilderness, and then Elimelech's like, I got a great idea. I'm going to leave God's house of bread where God promised to always provide and always be with us, and I'm going to move to the Islamic state and raise my family there. Like, how many parents are considering moving to Syria anytime soon because there's a, because it's just such a great place to raise your kids at this point? Right? It's that absurd. And the ancients would hear that and they're like, what are you doing, Elimelech? Why would you exchange the place of God's blessing? Yeah. His plan, and it's really fascinating like, he planned to just sojourn there. He planned to just kind of show up, check things out, right, and move on. 
But days often when we go to places like Mobile in our life, what do days turn into? Turn into weeks. What do weeks turn into quickly? Months. months. What do months turn into? Years. years. And years turn into a decade. And he raised his children. And he married his children in a land far from where God promised to be with him. And it's bizarre, and it's heartbreaking. All right, we pick it up. I'm just gonna like quickly take an aside. Can Satan create anything? Yes or no? No. No. What can Satan do? Count. He can corrupt, right? <laughs> Satan is not a creative being, right? Evil is not creative. It's destructive, manipulative, and destroys what's good. Right at this point, Elimelech is raising his family in the house of bread. A little bit of trial comes, and he exchanges the house of bread and goes and lives and dwells in a place that God is not present. In, 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 in ancient Moab, they, they worship a god named Chemosh. Say Chemosh. Chemosh. I'm sure that's a word you said this last week at some point. So Chemosh required everyone to be close to God. He required uh, infant sacrifice. So it's fascinating. He goes from a place in the promised land where God promised to be with him, and eventually Jesus comes to be a sacrifice so that people could be with them forever. He exchanges that for a place because it promised food and promised provision and promised to escape the moment of his trials to a place in a God that required human sacrifice to connect with him. I want to help you see that this decision by Elimelech is fraught with temptation. All right, let's keep moving. All right, the name of the man was Elimelech, and his name means my God is king. Where did Elimelech just move? <laughs> Moab, his name means what? My God is king. Bizarre. And the name of his wife, Naomi, means my delight. And the names of his two sons... <laughs> um, this is just terrible, right? Like, I just want to let you know, you don't want to name your kid just anything out of the Bible, right? Just to be clear, don't play like Bible roulette for kids' names, right? <laughs> the names of his two sons were Malon, which means sick, and Kilion, which means wasting away or annihilation. Like, uh. wait, if you did a bad job naming your kids, you at least did better than these guys. <clears throat> Right? And they were Ephrathites. And they're, they're, it's fascinating. So Bethlehem Bethlehem. means house of bread, and Ephrathites, the clan that lived in Bethlehem, their name means fruitfulness. Right? He's exchanging fruitfulness, God's promise for provision for Moab, and the promise of instant gratification. I'm sure no one here has ever done something like that. We've never exchanged a momentary pleasure of instant gratification for the bigger desire God's had. Probably just me, right? No one else here has ever done that. All right, let's keep moving on. Verse 3. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. Or, but we're not exactly sure what it means. Kind of means like gazelle or flighty, right? Ruth's name means friendship. And they live there about 10 years. We see that famine destroyed Elimelech's and their family's relationship between God's promised place where he promised to dwell and be with them and their family and the decision to move to Moab ultimately cost the price of worship of the God who lives there, which is a sacrifice of his own children. I think it fascinating that the author admits who got married to who. And you know why he does that? Probably, because it doesn't matter. It's needless information, right? This family who was just going to Moab for a quick trip ended up settling there, right? And the man that went there stayed there 
settled there and died there outside of the promised land where God covenanted to be with them. And this 10 years is really significant. Uh, so in, in the Old Testament, 10 years was kind of the culturally expected time that parents would uh, create progeny, right? And so not only has Elimelech lost his chilled sons, but he's lost the hope of his line living past him. And Naomi, right after 10 years, people would just assume that the hope of children would never come. It's ironic that Moab, the promised provider of food for survival when Bethlehem was barren, proves to be the scene of human barrenness with no seed to carry on the family line. Let's continue on. And both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Not only has Naomi lost her children by this point in the story, what else has she lost? What did they use instead of her name there? Go look. Next one. What did they call her? What does the author call her instead? The woman, right? In the Hebrew, they do not use her name Naomi anymore. They switch, right? That name that defined her. And who remembers what her name meant? Delight. To my delight, right? That the author pulls that name from her and calls her the woman. Because in Moab, and when we travel to places like that, our delight gets what? Ripped from. When we live outside of God's will, and as we decide to exchange God's perfect will and plan for our life when things get hard, for something secondary, it tears and destroys us at the depths of our being, even in our very name. Moab, the place that promises abundance and blessing, delivers a curse instead. So in the world, I just want to, we're going to be doing this quite a bit. The ancient world, very different or very similar to our world? Similar. Very, very, very different. Did women have rights in the ancient world? No. no. None. Naomi had no children to protect her. She had no children to provide for. She had no husband. And she was living like in modern day Syria completely disconnected from everyone she knows. The only people she has left are the Moabite wives. And uh, so Moabite women don't have the best reputation in the Old Testament. Uh, so the original hearers hearing this would not find that to be particularly comforting that she's in a faraway land with just her Moabite daughter-in-laws, with no children, with nothing. And at this point, her parents, she's too old to have another baby. We find that out later. So she doesn't have an opportunity to remarry. She can't go back to her parents' house because she's old enough that most likely they're not alive. And then they just kind of stop. And that's where we'll finish today. That's Naomi in this seemingly hopeless situation, far from home, stuck in her circumstance because she made, her and Elimelech did not make the best choices 10 years before when things got hard in the midst of God's will. I love to just like beat up on a limelech. Who here would just rather just beat up on a limelech the rest of the time? All right, that's totally not going to happen. Who am I going to beat up on? Us. Because here's why. We all have our Moab. Each and every one of us has that place that we are tempted to go when things get hard. We just spent the last three months with Paul in 2 Timothy, and, and Paul over and over in the New Testament talks about this idea that there's a new self being raised up, and what's fighting in contradiction to that? This old self, this person that was crucified with Christ so that that old self no longer lives, right? And so this, this idea that we see continually in the New Testament of the old man, the old person inside of us, the person that wants our flesh and our desires, to be constantly fulfilled. That's very similar to what the author is getting at for the first years when he's talking about Moab. Right? It's those places where we are ruled by our carnal desires. 
And I just want to acknowledge that as people, when things get hard inside of God's bounds, it gets really tempted to move outside of it. Amen? Amen. Like, it just, that's how it works. Like, it's incredibly difficult when things are hard to stay focused on the things that God has for us. And, and it's kind of bizarre. Did Elimelech go to Moab for a bad reason? No. Oh, I'm at, stand up real quick if you're a dad. Stand up real quick. If you're a dad, stand up real fast. All right, this was Elimelech's decision. They put it on Elimelech. If you're a dad, stand up. Or if you can't stand up, that's okay. You've been a dad for a long time. <laughs> if your family didn't have food, to what lengths would you go to provide food for your family? Is there anything you wouldn't do? Is there anything you wouldn't do if you were fearful that your children were going to starve to death? No. Anything? Is there anything you wouldn't do? Right? All right sit down. Like, like, think about that. Like, Elimelech is at this moment where he's like, if I don't feed my family, I'm not going to make it. My line's going to be cut off. But in the midst of that fear, and I'm going to say as, as men, like, on occasion we make decisions based on fear of the future. Can I get an amen from anyone other than myself? Yeah. Right? There is a worry about the future as men. Right? I'm not a woman, I don't know what that's like. Uh, even if I wore a dress, I wouldn't be one. Right? It just doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry, that's not helpful. And a terrible image, I apologize. Scrub your eyes. I do not have the legs for that at all. Um, it's, 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 I'm going to stop talking. Um, not in the book or on the notes. Um, yikes. Okay, we'll forget that happened. We'll move on. That was a terrible image. I was trying to think about what color it would be and everything and style. And there's no good one. Um, anyway, so often we end up in Moab not for bad reasons, right? Elimelech's intent was to provide for his family, but instead he brought death, destruction, and a breaking of his family line that only God could repair. I just want to say, like, Often when we're in Moab and in that place in our life where we're living for that old self, it's not out of bad intentions. Sometimes it is. Sometimes we just like sin and make poor choices because we're just carnal and we're like, ooh, that sounds good, I want it. But often we're trying to do something good, right? And we get sidetracked. Sometimes we make decisions based on providing for our family that are not best for their eternal salvation. Amen? Some people work too much. And they want to provide their family with such a good life that they're never present with their family. And can you love and serve and be, love and serve and lead your family well if you are not with them? No, it's not possible. There's no amount of money that takes care of that. Right? Sometimes we go into these places because we're fearful and we want to protect ourselves. Like sometimes when we're hurt physically or emotionally or spiritually, we close ourselves off from other people. Anyone ever done that before? Right? You get hurt, do you want to just like spew it in front of everyone? Maybe there's like one or two of us who do that. Right? But the rest of us, normal people, right? Instead, like when we're hurt, what do we want to do? We want to hide and not be with the people around us. Right? When God's best says that, that he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we wander off the path, we often try to self-isolate and hide from other people like they might find out we're not perfect. Oh, shucky darn, nobody thought you were anyway, right? But, but seriously, like this is such a big deal. Like, in trying to self-preserve, we often cut ourselves off from the same people who will be with us and strengthen us when things get hard. I think often we end up in Moab in our lives when we have fear of the unknown and we try to control things that we can't control. Anyone ever done that other than me? How many people somewhat are fearful of the future? On occasion, once or twice, you worried about the future, how things might turn out. Right? How many people have changed their future? that requires the sacrifice of a child. Moab is a real place in this story and Moab's a real, very real place in our lives. It's a place that we flee outside of God's presence when life gets hard. And I'll be honest, I don't wanna, I don't wanna beat us up for it, but Moab, was, did Moab seem alluring when he was hungry? 
Like when he's hungry, how good does Moab sound? At least there's food. Yeah, they practiced child sacrifice. Yeah, they've been killing us for a long time. Yeah, they tried to kill us when we came into the promised land. Yeah, they worship a different God. But there's food. And there's comfort. And there's what I want in that place. And when we get and we take that step outside of God's will, outside of God's bands, and we dwell in Moab, at least in my own life, here are some things that I have experienced when I stepped outside of God's will in my life. Often I hear things like, hey, your sin's no big deal, right? Would it be any big deal in Moab if they, uh, let's say, live their life outside of the bounds of God's will in Moab? Do you think anyone cared? No. I think if they weren't, like, reading the Bible with their family, if they weren't praying, if they weren't serving, if they weren't giving. Do you think people in Moab cared? Like, I've watched so many people work through their recovery, right? And they never get clean, they never get sober until they cut off the people who lived that previous life, right? I've never seen someone who wrestled with an addiction long-term who ever got clean and sober without starting over with a fresh community. But when we're in Moab, we surround ourselves with people living similar ways. And they tell you things like, you have the right to do what you feel is good. That's a terrifying thing. If it feels right, what must it be? It must be right because it feels right. And they tell you, you deserve it. Like, you deserve to not be afraid about the Like You deserve to have everything that you need and everything you want when you want it. But Jesus doesn't work that way. Like God's not like a magical slot machine that we pull down whenever we want something. God doesn't promise our life is going to be perfect. What does he promise to do instead? He promises to what? Be with with us. And in the promised land, God promised to be with him even when it got hard, even when he was fearful of his future, even when he's fearful of his present, even when he's fearful of what's going to happen with his children. God promises to be with him. And for us today, God promises to be with us in the midst of suffering, in the midst of difficulty, And I want to give us, just like the last few minutes, I want to give us some tools of what to do when we find ourselves in Moab. I think it's incredibly important for each of us to know where our Moab is. Like, what's the lie, what's the promise that will get us to compromise and live outside of the will of God in our life? Like, maybe it's comfort for you. I don't, I don't know what it is, right? Maybe it's comfort. Maybe you just don't, really don't like being uncomfortable. And sometimes loving Jesus is uncomfortable, amen? Yeah. Right, maybe it's not. Like, it's really uncomfortable, right? Like, it was fascinating. This is, like, one of the odd things about moving to Michigan from California. When I was in California, I was so hesitant to tell people I was a pastor because it would immediately erect a wall, and, like, I couldn't talk with them about Jesus because they had so many presuppositions about what it meant to love and follow Jesus they spiritually weren't open, right? And so I found myself getting into the habit of like not sharing with people that (laughs) until we've known each other for a while. And it's fascinating, like, I really believe I was driven by fear in that, that they wouldn't accept me. They wouldn't want to be my friend. Like, I know that sounds weird, but it's real, right? And we all need to know like where our Moab is. Is it the place, is it, we're really fearful about our future and our financial security, so we work we work, and we work, and we work for a future that may never be there, right? And we put off the present, and we don't take our spouse on a date, and we don't read to our kids, and we don't pray with our kids, because mom and dad need to work. Maybe it's comfort. Maybe there's, God's calling you to be serving in a new and uncomfortable place, and comfort keeps us from doing that. I think it's really important to be aware of our sin proclivities as people, because we all have them. We all have them. Second, what do we do when we're tempted to go? I wish a little like had a good friend. I've had the blessing of having really great brothers in Christ for my entirety of my faith journey. I've had a mentor consistently since the age of like 14. For 14, I'm, I know I look really old, but I'm only 35, mm-hmm. right? Like I look like an 80, right? But it's all the gray hair. Um, I've been so blessed when I was ready to make a dumb decision and ready to make a long-term decision for my family that was outside of God's will, to have other people to speak into the decisions. 
Now, don't have fools speaking into your decisions in your life, right? Not every person around you is a wise person to go to for counsel. But when we're tempted to go, we need other people. No one overcomes temptation on their own. It, it, it doesn't work. Your self-control is not that good. It's just not. It's finite. So when you're tempted to step into that place and step out of God's will, find a friend. Like if you say, like, hey, I'm feeling tempted, I'm having a hard time, I guarantee you they're not going to judge you. And if they do, tell them to stop sinning and pray for you. Right? Like, they're not going to do that. They're going to be for you in the midst of that temptation. So tell them, find another believer who will encourage you and bless you in the midst of that. And lastly, what do we do when we find ourselves in Moab? Anyone can think of a moment where they found themselves in Moab over the course of their life? Maybe more than once? Mine's more than once. Yours probably isn't. I have some incredibly good news to you. There was a man named Jesus. And because he lived and he died, you and I have instant access back to God. And Naomi, as we're going to find, has a decent walk to get back to the promised land. Because of Jesus, you and I don't need to go to a specific place, but the person in that person's name is Jesus. When we choose to move away from Christ, we choose to be far from life and hope, but God gives us a place. And in the Old Testament, it was a promised land where God promises to be. And for us today, that person is who? Who is it? It's Jesus. And he promises to be with us. Jesus says, I came to bring life and to bring it abundantly in John 10. And if you're living a life that's not in the abundance of God, like you don't need to trek the miles and miles to Israel. Where do we need to go? It's one step back to God. It's like, God, I'm a dwelling in a place outside of your will. I want to be in your will. It's one step back. It's what Christians call repentance. It's turning from the way you're living, making a 180 degree turn in a new direction to follow Jesus. And it's not always something significant, right? These moments out of Moab aren't like, oh, I was selling thousands of pounds of heroin, right? It's not that often. It's like, God's inviting me to serve, and I'm terrified to do it. So I'm not going anywhere near that place God's calling me. It's I've got a friend who wants to hear about Jesus, but I'm terrified to tell him about it because of what they might think. It's I'm so concerned about my future, I'm going to work 80 hours a week, not see my family so I can provide security in the future while losing eternity in the present. If you're in Moab right now, get out fast. Because eventually it costs us everything. When we live outside of the life and abundance that God has as as worship team comes up and we, we finish with some worship, I want to just read a scripture from, from Romans 8 as we drop the lights and kind of take some time to reflect and respond. I want to encourage you to figure out where you are in this season. Where are those places of temptation for you to live outside of God's will? And is there condemnation in Christ? No. Christ said there's no, there's no condemnation in Christ. There's grace and forgiveness and there's mercy as you return to the Lord. So here are these words from Romans chapter 8. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, or depths, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me read that one more time. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's one step back always. It's one step back to Jesus, and it's one step in to follow the next place. I'm going to invite you as we sing this next song. Uh, God promises to be faithful, forgive when we live outside of his will. 
And so I want you to invite you to take some time. If there's an area of your life where there's a hidden sin or where there's something you know that God's calling you to do and you're terrified to do it, pray that God will give you courage. Pray that God will surround you with people before you in that journey. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so grateful that you are a God who never leaves us or forsakes us. And you rescue us from our Moab. And you're patient with us. And you're gracious with us. And your words are not words of condemnation, but of invitation to return to you. Lord, I pray for people here, and we pray for this church, and we pray for our community, that as people around us are struggling and living in darkness, they would see the great light that is you. They would experience your grace. They would return to you. Lord, I pray for this church. Lord, I pray for the courage to follow you where you lead. And we would follow you when you bring correction. We would be grateful for it as you invite us to newness of life. May there be grace at the center. Lord Jesus, we trust you. And if you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want you to know in the midst of your Moab, God is beckoning you to live in freedom and in light. And thankfully, Jesus paid the price to bring us back into right relationship. All we have to do is ask, and that salvation is freely given as we freely received. So if you're here today, and it's been a while since you and Jesus have spent time together, if you're hearing about this for the first time, I encourage you that that Jesus hears you and knows you and has seen everything and welcomes you back regardless of where you've come from with grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Lord, hear us as we take this time to pray and listen and be with you. of the ones who came for us, the one who saves us, and the ones who journeys with us. As you go this week, know that God goes with you, and if you find yourself in the midst of darkness, living outside of God's will, know that God welcomes us home over and over and over and over again. That the grace of God is that big and that wide and that deep. Go in that same grace be agents of blessing as you go until we gather again. I'll see you next week, church. I'm at the uh, tear down of the highway in.
Yeah, I think it's got a thing on the bottom that's got a hook on it or a... I don't know, I'm not for sure what that thing is called, but it grabs it. Talk to my daughter, Tara. Today they turned down the highway in. What's that? They talked to my camera. Oh, get down there. That guy up on that thing has got to be having a lot of fun. He paid $49 an hour to do that. There's a big I beam that held the whole building together. Show you something of interest. That's my daughter, Kara. Out here with a camera, so I taught her something right.
I'm telling you this because you care. This is my first scooter ride in April since my surgery. Man, it feels good to be back on it, even though it's only two miles from home. Good to be down here. Yesterday, Becky had her van stop on uh, 31 going up the hill right from River Street. Had to have a wrecker pull her home. Try to show you what it's doing. Absolutely. But yeah. it seems like we've remedied that. Right? Okay, we're going to uh, turn off the radio. Car starts right away. Well, it's not doing it this time. <laughs> There. Quits. Put it back in. It won't go. While I'm on 31, looking south. Looking north just to check out traffic. Instructions as to how to go about our worship this morning. Uh, it's just a, it's such a, such a blessing to be here and be able to worship. Uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer real quickly, and then we're going to begin the worship service with the Builder Kingdom here. Father, we are thankful to be here this morning in, the, in your presence and the presence of other believers. And we don't take it for granted. Uh, we pray that you would put this psalm on our heart as we worship this morning, that we would lift our voices in praise unto you. We ask your blessing on all we do here this morning. We humbly ask you.